It is so good to be with you tonight in Brisbane. And uh, just to let you know, if you are um, worried about or confused about the accent, that's because I'm a Toowoomba boy. Anybody been to Toowoomba? Anybody born in Toowoomba? No one. And uh, yeah, I'm a Toowoomba boy. I'm actually English born, born in Manchester in England, the city that I now pastor in. And then when I was two, my dad brought the whole family out to Queensland where dad was pastoring in Toowoomba for a whole heap of years. Then when I was 15, went back to England. My dad was pastoring. He said, hey, Glenn, uh, I need you to do two things. I said, what's that, dad? He said, firstly, I need you to join the band. And I said, dad, have you seen the band? And the band at that stage was comprised of two people. We had a little old lady over here who was 90% deaf and she played the organ. And because she was so deaf, she couldn't keep up with where we were at and singing. So she would always play the echo to the line that we just sang. And then the other musician was a guy on this side of the stage on the opposite end. And he, his name was Bob. And I promise you, I'm not making this up. He was a builder. And Bob the builder played a piano accordion. So we had Moses' wife on that end. We had Bob the Builder over there. And I said, Dad, the problem is this. If I join that band, I will not make any friends whatsoever. And I said, the problem is this also, Dad. I don't play an instrument. So Dad said, that's okay. I'll buy you a guitar tomorrow. You've got six days to learn, son. And uh, six days later, I was leading worship. Uh, second thing Dad said is, you're going to have to be the youth pastor. I said, Dad, there's no youth in the church. He goes, I know. You're the only one wearing jeans. You've got the job, son. And uh, that was it. And so I did that for five years. And then when I was 20, I came back to Australia. I went to Alpha Crucis College. I uh, studied there for three years. It was then called Southern Cross College. And during that time, met in love. Uh, f- met, hmm, let me say it again. Met and fell in love with uh, my South American bride, Sophia. And so we got married at the end of Bible College. And uh, at the end of Bible College, just really felt the Lord leading us back to the United Kingdom. So it was youth pastor for 13 years and uh, pioneered our church in Manchester 13 years ago. We have seven locations, three in Manchester. We're in Chester, we're in Cardiff, we're in Sheffield, we're in Geneva, in Poland, and one other that I've forgotten about, don't tell them. And uh, we're really excited with everything God is doing in the UK. And if you don't know about this, there's a war taking place in Europe right now. And uh, all of Europe is braced for that. All of Europe is involved in that in so many different ways. Our church in Krakow in the south of Poland is now housing 1,100 refugees out of the Ukraine. But what President Putin fails to realize is that the Ukraine is the cradle for Orthodox Christianity in Europe. And as the 7 million refugees have fled out of the Ukraine, they're planting churches everywhere they go. In fact, we know, we personally know of hundreds of new churches that have been planted in Europe. And the thing is this, whenever the devil tries to beat you down, God's got a great way of taking the stick and beating the devil back in Jesus' name. So we gotta have hope this Pentecost Sunday. Come on, somebody. We gotta have hope this Pentecost Sunday that that which the devil's tried to use to harm you, God can use it to benefit you in Jesus' name. And then three years ago, I became the national leader of Assemblies of God in Great Britain and, uh, and learning from Pastor Wayne Alcorn on the go. Uh, my thinking is this, if he can do it, then maybe I can do it as well in Jesus' name. All right, Romans chapter 12 tonight. Romans chapter 12. Let me read to you from the New American Standard Version. It says this, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone not to think of themselves more highly than they ought, but to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each of us a measure of faith. A measure of faith. My question to you tonight on this Pentecost Sunday night is this, is what measure of faith do you have? What measure of faith are you living with? And I'm not now talking about saving faith. There's different types of faith. There's natural faith. The fact that you sat on a chair tonight shows me that you understand natural faith. You didn't test it. You didn't see if it was gonna hold you. You've sat on a chair before. And so tonight you came to church and you sat down. Natural faith. The next side of faith is saving faith. Saving faith is the faith that God gives to you. He put it in your heart. He put it in your spirit. And the reason you became a Christian, or if you are not yet, the reason you're on a spiritual journey is because God is putting saving faith in you. There reaches that moment where you recognize and realize you're lost without Jesus. You need Him in your life. I was uh, just a few years ago up in Townsville and went scuba diving off the reef there. 
And the diving instructor in the boat, he said, ladies and gentlemen, while you're diving and you get in, if you get into distress, look out for and hang on to the Jesus line. I put up my hand, I said, bud, what's the Jesus line? And he's, he's knocking back the tinnies, he's swearing, I can tell he's, he's not a follower of Jesus. And, and he's, he's, his mouth is horrible and he's talking about all sorts of stuff. And he says, well, the Jesus line's out the back of the boat. He said, you're gonna see some orange boys floating on top of the water. And from that, we hang chains that go about 20 feet into the water. We call that the Jesus line. If you hang and get into distress, look out for it and hang on to it. And I said, yeah, but why'd you call it the Jesus line? As he opens another tinny, he said, don't you know, dummy, everyone needs a saviour. And there's that moment where in your life, saving faith is ignited and you know, I need God. So when we're talking about a measure of faith here tonight from Romans chapter 12, we're not talking about a measure of faith to sit on a chair and we're not talking about the measure of faith to be saved. We're talking tonight about the measure of faith you have when it comes to self-leadership, when it comes to your family, when it comes to your finances, your marriage, when it comes to your work life, when it comes to church ministry, what is your measure of faith? Just prior to the pandemic, I caught the last flight into Oslo in Norway. And I, I went out into the waiting area to see where the driver was to pick me up. I phoned my friend, it's about 11.30 at night. I said, hey, Oystein, Pastor Oystein, um, I'm here, where's the car? He went, oh mate, I am so sorry. I forgot to send the car to pick you up. I said, no worries, I'll catch an Uber. What's, what's the address for where I'm staying? He says, no, no, no. He said, I'm sending a car right now. We always like to greet our guests. I thought to myself, it would have been great if you could have greeted me half an hour ago, but I didn't say it. So I waited for an hour. I went to the cafe, it was just closing. And I said to the lady, hey, can I have a long black? Can I have an Americano please, no milk? She says, no problem, and she puts the coffee on the counter. She says, 10 krona, the currency, 10 krona. So I put the currency on the counter. I took the coffee, she looked at the krona, looked at me, and pulled the coffee back. I thought, this is a strange Viking custom. I looked at the krona, looked at her, pulled the coffee back, and this merry, awkward dance went for about 10 seconds, felt like 10 years, until finally she said, sir, you need to know something. The currency of Norway is krona. The currency of Denmark is also krona. Same name, different currency. She said, what you've done is you've come to Norway with Danish currency and you're trying to buy a coffee with the wrong money. And she said this, she said, if you change the currency, we will have a transaction. Now, you know this tonight with me, don't you? That the currency of heaven is one thing and that one thing is faith. The only way we exchange with God, the only way we live for God, the only way we interact with Him and see heaven come to earth, the Bible says, is by faith. In fact, it says this. It says that faith, by faith, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So we need a living, active faith. Faith to work, faith to love, Faith to forgive, faith to go, faith to build, faith to plant, faith to reap, faith to sow, faith to destroy, faith to do every area of life. We need faith. And the Bible says that God has given to you and to me a measure of faith. So tonight, what is your measure of faith? The Bible gives us different measures of faith here. It says in Mark chapter four, Jesus speaking, he says, hey, speaking to his disciples, why are you still afraid? Do you still have no faith? I want you to think about this glass, this vessel being your life for a moment. Jesus here is speaking to his followers. They've spent some time with him. They've seen him do some miracles, water into wine. They've seen a certain amount of things. And Jesus is really surprised because his followers have no faith. Did you know it's possible to be saved and be in church and still have areas of your life where you have no faith? Something's missing. It's, it's impossible to interact and, and see heaven come to earth because in certain areas of our life, we have no faith faith for a miracle. The reality is this, the Bible says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. And so there can be times and seasons where you are so 
tired of believing again and again and again, we can end up in a season where we have no faith. The context of this passage of no faith, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He's saying, hey guys, don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry. I define worry like this. Worry is practical atheism. That on a Sunday, you can say with your mouth, I worship you, the atmosphere is changing here. But if after church, the first thoughts are consumed with worry, our thinking is telling us that God is not real. He's saying, no, no, don't worry. Why have you got no faith? I love Ryan before chatting away about winter in Brisbane. You wuss, honestly. We have summer in Manchester in England on a Tuesday once a year between two and four in the afternoon and then it's gone, mate. I mean, I mean, I mean, winter in the UK is out of control. It's cold from basically October until about May. And then we have two or three months where it's nice. And when we mean nice, Ryan, what we mean is we don't have the heating system on. But then it gets to about October time. You know, we're getting to the end or the, the back half of autumn as we're approaching winter. And that's usually in church life where the counseling lines start to increase because married couples start to argue. And the reason there's an argument is the arguments over the heating system. Happens like this every year for me and my wife. I'll come into the house one day on an October afternoon and I open the front door and it's like walking onto the face of the sun. And I'll say, Sophia, what on earth is going on? She said, I was chilly, so I put on the heating system. I'm like, babe, just put on a hoodie. You don't need the whole house heated. The way we heat our houses in England is this, is we have a central heating system that, that, that heats the water and pushes the water through the pipes to the radiators on the wall, which give the heat for the whole house. Just three years ago, four years ago, I woke up on an October morning. The, the, it was cold outside. The central heating kicked in, and there was this horrible squealing sound. I ran around the house. I'm kicking my toes and stubbing, stubbing my toe on, on door frames. I'm in the dark trying to work out what is that noise. And then I get to the central heating system and realize that the high-pitched scream, squeal, is coming from the heating system. I turn it off at the wall, I call a plumber. The plumber comes over that afternoon. He says, what's the problem? I said, listen to this. I put it on and he goes, what is that noise? I'm like, that's your job. <laughs> he does a little bit of testing and he, he said this. He said, Glenn, he said, during the spring, summer and autumn months, while you've not had your heating system on, there has been a low, slow leak in the system. And now where there should be water, there is nothing there. And so instead of heating the water and pushing the water through the house, what's happening is there's nothing there. It's trying to push the air and we have a noise, we have no heat because there is nothing there. He said, we've got to fix the leak, then we've got to refill it, and then we can change the atmosphere of your house. It is possible to be a Christian and have no faith. It is possible to have natural faith and saving faith, but no faith for life, for leadership, for business, for health, for family. And Jesus here is really surprised when he finds people with no faith. He goes on here in Matthew chapter six and says, uh, if that's how God clothes you the grass, which is here today and tomorrow thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith, little faith. So if that's no faith, I reckon this is what little faith looks like. And this is actually where he speaks about worry. People of little faith. Notice here, Jesus is saying faith is measurable. That in one instance, there's no faith. And in another instance, he's amazed because there's just a little bit of faith. But there's also a sense tonight, church, that even with a little bit of faith, you can do a lot. The Bible says if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can speak to that mountain and tell it to be thrown into the sea. It's actually not about how much faith you have. It's about what you do with the measure of faith that you have. Jesus actually goes on here in the Bible and the Bible tells us that a little bit further on in Matthew chapter eight, it says this, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed. And he said to those following him, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such 
great faith. I wonder what great faith looks like. I wonder if we can suggest that maybe tonight that's what it is to be a follower of Jesus with great faith. I mean, surely that's the goal, right? Surely that's what we're after. Surely we want to be men and women of God who have great faith because surely it, it's, it's the heroes of old, the great Christians who, who came out into Australia, into Queensland 80 plus years ago and started to plant the ACC churches. Surely they were men and women of great faith. Didn't it take your family, your friends, your parents, great faith to start that business? Surely it took you great faith to start that. that that's what we want to be, right? People of great faith. I love church history. I love reading about the heroes of old. I love a man by the name of George Mueller who lived in Bristol in England in a very different time to today. One day as he wandered through the streets of Bristol, he saw the plight of the children who were discarded like stray dogs just living on the streets. And so he decided he would set up a children's home. He gathered the children from the streets of Bristol and he put them in housing, he gave them clothing and started to give them education and give them food. It's an amazing story because when you read about his life and you read about his ministry, there were many times when he would set the table for breakfast for the children. He would gather the children together and they would come and he would pray and thank God for his provision for the food for the children. But he knew full well there was no food in the cupboard, no food in the pantry. And yet he still with great faith, would pray and thank God for his provision. Oh, when you read the story of his life, you begin to realize that on many occasions, uh, the bread cart lost its wheel just outside the children's home. The axle on the milk cart broke right outside the front doors. And time and time again, because of great faith, we saw miracle after miracle God provide. Surely that's what we wanna be, right? One time, George Mueller was sailing to the United States of America in one of the tall sailing ships. And just as he was about a day or two away from the North American coast, the, the captain of the vessel, he, he put the anchor in the ocean and they stopped sailing. George Mueller goes up into the captain's cabin and says, Captain, why are we not sailing? I have an appointment that's coming up and I've never been late for an appointment. And I don't wanna start now. And the captain said this, Mr. Mueller, sir, there is a thick fog and if we can't see, we can't sail. At which point, George Mueller adopted the position of the man of great faith. He got on his knees to pray. It was a little bit awkward. The captain decided he would join him on his knees, as did the crew. And George Mueller prayed a prayer. He said, Lord God, I thank you for this appointment that was made since before time began. You know the end from the beginning. And I've never been late. For an appointment, I never want to start now. So Lord, I thank you that you've answered this prayer and I thank you that you have removed the fog. Amen. When he said amen, the captain thought, maybe I should pray. So the captain started to pray. George Mueller, a man of great faith, said, sir, no, no, you don't need to pray for two reasons. Firstly, you're a man of no faith. And secondly, because I believe God has already answered my prayer. The history books tell us that when George Mueller stood up and they looked outside the cabin, the fog was gone and George Mueller made his appointment on time. Great faith? What's your measure of faith? Uh, that, that's not it though. There's another measure of faith that we read about in Scripture and it's found in Acts chapter 6. And in Acts chapter 6, the Bible says that they were searching and they found a man called Stephen. Stephen was wonderful because Stephen was a man, the Bible says, who was full of faith. In Romans chapter 12, verse three, it says that God has given us measures of faith. And now what we're seeing is the measure, the faith is measurable. We have no faith, little faith, great faith, and now we have full of faith. And my question is this, is what is your measure of faith? This Pentecost Sunday, on this Sunday that we remember, the Holy Spirit was given to empower us. What is your measure of faith? But all through here, Jesus is wanting you to know, the Bible wants you to know that your faith is a measurable quotient. Let me ask you this. Does anybody wanna know how to increase their measure of faith? Give me a wave. Okay, I'm gonna go to an inspired side over here. Does anyone over here wanna know how to increase their measure of faith? Give me a wave. I'm gonna show you how. Jeremy, come here, mate. Just 
Stand here for a second. This is my friend Jeremy. I've known him for a long time, 45 years. I knew him. I knew him. I've got some stories I can tell you about. In fact, I've got some great pictures on my phone over there. You look thirsty, Matt. I don't know, I don't know what that is, but try that for a second. It's grape juice, isn't it? Whew, that's good news. You can, you can grab a seat. Thanks, man. Jeremy, I want you to imagine for a moment that I'm God and you're you. And I want you to see the transaction that happened in that moment. As God, I gave him a great measure. How much did he take? How much did he possess? How much did he imbibe? How much did he take ownership of? Thanks, mate, you can grab a seat. How much did he take upon himself? My question is this, was it up to him or was it up to me how much he had? God gave him a measure of faith. But I think, Jeremy, you must be English. Thank you, Jesus. (laughs) Wonderful. Good vintage. Wonderful. wonderful. That, That sometimes, in actual fact, what happens is God says, no, you don't understand. I have given you a greater measure of faith than what you realize. And if with a little measure we can speak to the mountains, then what could our church do? What could we do tonight if in marriage and if in family and if in business and if in health, our mental health, what happens if we actually became people who were full of faith? You see, I think we get our theology wrong somewhere. Not here, because in Queensland we're perfect, but definitely everyone in New South Wales, they mess this up all the time. I think their theology of God is a little bit twisted. It's kind of like in my house when I have a hot bath. I live in England where it's cold a lot and rainy. I go to football games and the clue is in the title. Guys, it's a foot and a ball. There's no hands involved. Don't come to England and call it soccer. You get stabbed in the face. It's football. And I support God's team, Manchester City Football Club. Have season tickets, go to most home games. Go to European Champion League games, midwinter, blizzard, cold outside. I know how cold a game is based on how many hot chocolates I've drunk through the game. You know, when I go home after a cold night out in Manchester, I'll go home and being a good English boy now, I'll make myself a cup of tea, Yorkshire English breakfast tea, and I'll drink it, but it won't quite warm me up enough. And so what I tend to do then is I have a hot bath. Now the clue's in the title, it's a hot bath, not a lukewarm bath, it's a hot bath. So what I tend to do is this, I tend to put the plug in in the bath and I put on the hot water. No cold water because it's a hot bath. Jeremy does it too. And ladies, I don't know if you know what your husband does whenever he has a bath. I know we live in a shower society in Australia, but go with me. That that when your husband has a bath, uh, I need to tell you what he does. We men, what we do is we put in the bath anything we think that will clean us. Dishwashing liquid, (laughs) bleach, toothpaste, calf polish, furniture polish. Because the reality is this, is we expect the suds to do all the work as we just lie there. But when I got married 26 years ago, I discovered that when a woman has a bath, it's a completely different thing. It's all about the experience. (laughs) So when my wife has a hot bath, she's thought about it. She puts on the hot tap and the cold tap. She goes off and she comes back with some scented candles that she puts around the bath. She, she, she lights them and then she turns off the lighting. She goes off and gets the Bluetooth speaker and comes back. And it's not worship music. Don't want any of that nonsense. No, we're going to have whales crying or dolphins laughing in the background. And then my wife has so thought about it. She's planned about it. She's planned it. She's been to a shop that no man in his right mind will ever go to. It's called Lush. Because we men, when we walk past it, we just start sneezing. I know I'm generalizing now, and I, you can get in trouble for this. If you're upset with me, my name is Pastor Wayne Alcorn, okay? You can, you, you can email me. But, you know, and my wife, what she'll do is she will buy something called a bath bomb, which is hilarious. Because for a man, a bath bomb is something completely different to that. But that's for a leadership lecture another time. She put the bath on. For me, it's, it's a hot bath. And this is what I do. I still do it even now. I run the hot bath. Too, too much, no cold water whatsoever. So it comes to the moment and I put my foot in, out, in, 
out. You shake it all about. You do the hokey cokey and yeah, and it's too hot. So I put my dressing gown on, I finish my cup of tea, I come back a little while later, I'm still cold, my foot's in, out, in, out, in, out, until finally I've got one foot in the bath. The skin is peeling off this leg. The rest of me, I've got stalactites, you know, hanging from there, I'm so cold. This is the dangerous bit, bro. Jeremy, this is the dangerous bit. You were telling me about this, remember? This is the dangerous bit. Now you've got to get this leg into there. Careful, Ryan, you change your religion if you slip, right? You kind of, one leg. And now you're in, out, in, out, shake it all about. You do the hokey cokey. You're too scared to turn around until finally you have two legs in the bath. Now the biggest challenge, Ryan. This is the biggest challenge. This is the hardest part. You gotta pluck up the courage because now you've gotta get... (laughs) In, out... Until finally, now you're sitting in the bath like this. You're not lying in, you're lying down, you're sitting. And you're like, this is comfortable. (laughs) You don't want to move because you don't want to create a tidal wave and burn your chest. You know what I'm talking about? So you just sat there going. Until finally, 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 you end up reclining. And it's usually at this point you think, I need a wee. (laughs) And that's the test of your upbringing. Are you a Toowoomba boy, Jeremy? Or are you from Brisbane, Ryan? But you know what I think? I think that we think, we don't preach this, we don't sing this, we don't say this, but I think that we think that that's how God treats us. You came to church, you heard the gospel, saving faith. Oh, Jesus, I, I, I think I need you. God says, well, thank you for praying that prayer, son. Thank you for praying that prayer, daughter. You can have my toe. And then the more we come to church, God says, wow, are you serious? You can have my foot. And then the more we go to church, we start volunteering, we get on teams and God says, oh, you are serious about me. You're gonna have both my foot, feet. (laughs) Sorry, English teacher. And then we reach a point of becoming like Pastor Wayne Alcorn, really holy. God says, you can have my bottom. (laughs) Until finally, we've been in church so long and God says, oh, you are so old and so mature. Now you can have all of me. But you know something? It's just not true. I I think it's what the devil whispered to us. I think it's what the devil whispered to us to help us to understand why that person over there is more blessed than we are. Why that person over there is is doing more, inverted commas, however you define that, than we are. And and says, "Well, well, it's because they got a greater measure than what you have. But I want you to know something. Something significant happened on Pentecost Sunday. Growing up in church, I reached a point of being 12 where I was over-churched in every way. We knew church, didn't we, mate? We knew church. We knew when the preacher was finishing. We, 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 We knew the flow of the service. And there came a moment when we were 12 and 13 and we decided to pray. To pray in our youth pastor's office. And we had two rules to our prayer meeting. Rule number one, no adults because they were the problem. And number two, no girls because we wanted to worship the Creator, not the created. And so on Monday night, we squeezed into our youth pastor's office in Toowoomba and prayed. Some of the boys in the room were baptized in the Holy Spirit and they spoke in tongues and their life was just demonstratively, powerfully changed in a moment. But not me. I said, God, God, I'm the pastor's kid. If anyone has the right to get you, it's me. Though you know, God, I run the church. I confessed to the Lord for the amount of times that I'd thrown rocks on the INC church across the road and I felt like the Lord had forgiven me. (laughs) You remember we prayed all week until it was a Friday or Saturday night and on the Friday or Saturday night, our youth pastor's office was, was packed full of teenage boys just crying out to God and in a moment, I can just tell you there was a moment when this over-churched boy, sick of church and sick of religion, I had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came and touched me in such a way that I knew I was changed forever after. I began to speak a language I'd never learned before. I didn't know what it was but I knew that something had happened in my spirit and I knew that something had happened beyond 
strong saving faith that had happened in my childhood. Now I had all of God in this moment. Not a little bit of God, not his foot, not two feet, but every part of God. Paul puts it this way in Ephesians 36 times in six chapters. You're in God, in God, in God, in God, in God, in God. And not only are you in God, but God's in you, every part of you. You have tonight all of heaven's resources. You see, there's another measure of faith as we think about this. And this other measure of faith is found in the story of the paralyzed man. And it's found in Mark chapter 9. It says this, Some men brought to Jesus a paralyzed man lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Take heart, son. Your sins are forgiven. I want you to notice in this passage, friends, that Jesus doesn't quantify or qualify the measure of faith. It just says he saw their faith. And in a world where social media is causing us to be distracted by comparing and contrasting our lives with the life of another, In a world where maybe we come into church and compare our Christianity to another person's Christianity, God says, no, I want you to take your eyes off these other measures of faith and just remember this measure of faith. And it's what I call just enough faith. You see, we don't know whether the four guys who took the paralyzed man to Jesus had great faith or were full of faith. But what we do know is this, they had just faith enough faith. 26 years ago, my wife and I got married. We were due to move to England in February 1996. And the problem we had is the day, the week that we were due to leave to go to England, my dad suddenly dropped dead of a massive heart attack. We didn't know he was sick, he'd been healthy, he walked every day, he was athletic. But at the age of 61, the Lord decided and said, hey, you're coming home with me. This was tough. It was tough for our family. I know many of you have walked through a similar experience. It was the week that we were due to move to England. I remember we stayed with mom and we made arrangements and we buried my father. And about six weeks later, we rebooked our ticket to fly to England. And I remember the day walking down the air bridge towards the jumbo jet that would take us to the United Kingdom. I remember walking down there and thinking to myself, Lord, this this cannot be right. My dad was my dad, but I was his biggest fan. He was my friend. He was my hero. And as I walked down the air bridge, I said to the Lord, Lord, just give me a sign that this is the right thing to do. Because I felt like walking back. I felt like taking my new bride and running back and and saying to my mum, we're going to stay in Australia. We were going to live in the city of Sheffield in England. And there I am walking down the air bridge at Brisbane Airport here saying, Lord, just give me one more sign. And I looked out the window of the air bridge and the British Airways jumbo had a name and it was called the city of Sheffield. I thought that's lucky. (laughs) And with a broken heart and tears streaming down our faces, we both in April 1996, had just enough faith to get on a plane. The illustration I'll give you now is monetary because it's easy to understand the analogy that I'm making, but you can apply this to every area of your life. We arrived into England and we became youth pastors. We were actually youth pastors for 13 years, but the first youth event we ever did, it, it, it required, get this, only $120. $120. Now, our salary was so low that Sophie and I would go to the supermarket every week with a calculator. And we would be putting food back at the checkout because we couldn't afford it. We can't afford that this week. And some of you know what that's like. And for two years, we lived with people in the back bedroom of somebody's house. And I remember this first youth event, this first Friday night, cost $120. And I prayed like I'd never prayed before. You know something? We got $120. The next one was about $1,000. If you thought I prayed for 120, you should have seen me pray for 1,000. 
But you know something, the thousand came in. We started to do youth week in, week out. We started to hire bigger venues. A a local civic center cost us $12,000. I didn't have $12,000, but I had just enough faith to believe that God could do it. And then we started to run uh, youth camps. And the youth camps were running at about $50,000. And and year in, year out, we started to see God do a $75,000. And then we started to run a conference. The conference was called Audacious Conference. Audacious Conference cost about $120,000 year one. And and that was good because that came in. And we we believed God and saw it happen. And then the trouble is this, is year in, year out, it started to grow. 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, 800,000, a million pounds. And then in the midst of this seeming success, my pastor says, I think you should go back to the city of your birth and plant a church. And so a few months later, we went to Manchester and we started on our first Sunday with 90 people. Six weeks later, we had 50 people. I thought, gosh, the way we're going, we've only got another six weeks left in us. I thought in about seven weeks time, my three-year-old son, he's going to have to lead worship. My daughter can preach, my my wife can take the offering and I'll have to give my life to Jesus. (laughs) But just enough faith to turn up the next week. It was 53. Our our rent every month was $4,000. I prayed like I'd never prayed before. Just tell mum I'll be there later. $4,000 and yet it came in. And then one day, a man came up to us. He, he phoned me. He said, hey, hey, Glenn, I hear you've got a growing church congregation. We were running five services at this point. It sounds great, but it wasn't. It was a building that can only legally seat 180. 9.30, 11.30, 1.30, 5 o'clock, 7 o'clock, and then go home and die and do it next week. <laughs> and he gave me the GPS coordinates. He said, come and see me at, at this address. And the next day when I drove up to this building, I looked at it. And this building was the very same building that on our first Sunday in front of 90 people, I put a picture of this very building on screen and said, hey church, one day we're going to do church in a building just like this. I said, how much? He said, $10 million. I said, I haven't got $10 million. Would you accept $5 million? He said, okay. Didn't have the heart to tell him I didn't have $5 million. <laughs> I thought that was a technicality but you know something with just enough faith he came in three acres of land city center of Manchester a block away from the concert hall where the Ariana Grande bombing happened that's where we have church look at the faith now usually at this point Pastor Wayne this is where the haters kick in This is where social media goes crazy. This is where the media people get involved. This is where people start to send hate mail and death threats and and, and people say, well, it's okay for you. Look at this. Look at what you've got. Look at what you're doing. And I'm like, yeah, 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 but where were you? When I walked down an air bridge with my wife, weeping with just enough faith to get on the plane. Hey, tonight, is it possible? That's all God's ever really looked for from you. Not full, not great, but the only thing He's ever been looking for, just enough faith. Just enough faith to love my wife one more day. Just enough faith, ladies, for you not to kill your husband (laughs) one more day. Musos, come and join me. Just, just enough faith to pray again. Just enough faith to sow again. Just enough faith to forgive again and again and again and again. And I want you to see that through this whole time, your measure of faith has been increasing. It was never about full and great. It was only ever about just enough faith. I'm nearly finished. We're going to pray. In October 2020, for some reason, coronavirus decided not to attack golf courses anymore. And our Prime Minister said, now you can play golf. So thank you, coronavirus, for leaving the golf courses alone. And we went and we played golf. It was October 2020. And I remember taking my cap off at the end of the round 
had the best round of golf I'd had for years. And taking my cap off, I could still see the peak of my hat like a shadow. And I thought to myself, that's really strange. And yet, I wasn't wearing a cap, but I could still see the peak. And so I went to the doctors two weeks later. She looked into my eye. She said, I'm going to send you to the clinic, the eye clinic in Manchester Central. So I went down to the eye clinic in Manchester Central. And you know it's not good when the eye consultant looks in your eye and says, that's not good. <laughs> I knew it was really not good when we ended up with seven consultants in the room. Turned out I've got an eye disease that is so rare that none of the consultants had ever seen this particular condition ever in their practice life. They, from that moment, started to prescribe me with monthly injections into the eye. So from January 2021 to June last year, 12 months ago now, monthly injections into the eye. Until June, about this time last year, they said, Glenn, we need you to come in for surgery. We, 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 you've got a tumour that's developing, non-cancerous. And if we don't operate, you're going to lose your eyesight. So at the end of June last year, they took me into the hospital in Liverpool and they did a procedure where they took out my eye, they removed the eye muscles, they stitched a radioactive plaque to the back of my eye, hoping that the radiation would cauterize all the bleeds in the eye. They then kept me in hospital for four or five days with a patch. They then at the end of the time took my eye back out, took the plaque off, put the eye muscles back in. And then about a month or six weeks later, I'm at home. July, end of July, 2021. It's two o'clock in the morning. I'm still not sleeping. Got a patch over my eye. And I've got to tell you, church, the darkness that hit my soul was overwhelming. The devil whispered, where's your God now? I thought he loved you, son. He doesn't love you. Thoughts that... What happens if this disease in this eye affects this eye and I don't actually end up being able to watch my daughter walk down the aisle when she gets married? How, how am I going to go not being able to see, read my Bible? And, and I know, friends, I know there are other people in the world who've got bigger problems than this, but this was very real to me. And as I lay in bed, weeping, heaviness, sad, I felt the Spirit of the Lord speak to me. Say, so son, do you tonight have just enough faith to get out of bed and worship? Thankfully, on this occasion, I did. I swung my legs out of bed, put my AirPods in, walked into the lounge room, and I walked up and down for two hours singing worship songs. I lay it all on, all on the altar and I worshipped and I worshipped and I worshipped. I didn't have enough faith for healing, but I had enough faith to worship, enough faith to say, God, I love you. And after two hours, I arrived at the point of understanding, God, it is better to know you than know why. And the heaviness, it just... I've done that five, six, maybe seven times since then, last year. But each time discovered that all the Lord wanted was just enough faith. And even tonight, I still only have 30% vision in my eye and the vision that I do have is completely blurry. But I woke up this morning, first thing I did is I thought, is this my moment? Healed? Not yet. But tonight, Ryan, I had just enough faith when you said, it's, you need a miracle, lift your hands. You see, all, all he wants is just for people to say, you see, if you over in this section, you have just enough faith. And in this section, you have just enough faith. And in this section, you have just enough faith. And, and in this section, you have just enough faith. And then we add the back section. Now we have, taking a verse horribly out of context, faith that is pressed down, shaken together. And now it's running all over. But it only ever happened because daily he only ever requires just enough faith